back in us, Lord, and in this place, Father God, that if we would humble ourselves before you, Lord God, that if we would turn our face to you, Father God, that you would come and you would heal our land. Hallelujah, Lord God. 
And that land includes our mind, our hearts, our bodies, our neighborhoods, our church, our country, this world. Work in us this morning, Lord God. Change our perspectives. Change what we think we know and put it on firm truth. Father God, you said not to entertain vain imaginations, and we cast vain imaginations down in Jesus' name. We lift up the glory of your truth, that it would be made known, Father God, and you would be glorified in it. Work in us, Lord. Work in us, Father. our justice, set down our doubt, set down our stubbornness, to set down our rebellion, all of it, that we would have the fullness of Christ living in us, that we would abide in his presence. Abide in Him, there's peace, there's joy, there's love, there's kindness, there's long suffering, patience. Scripture says not to give up meeting together, but to continue to encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The day is approaching. Well, the reason we gather together today, one of the reasons is to encourage one another. And one of the ways that we do that is by listening for the voice of the Holy Spirit. Not speaking our own thoughts, our own words, our own opinions, but listening to the voice of God. As you're worshiping the Lord, as you're in his presence, would you just listen for a word of encouragement or of comfort, or maybe of exhortation. And it might be for the whole church. It might be just for another individual uh, here, or maybe somebody you need to text during greeting time. But would you listen for that word right now? decision that if the Lord gives you a word to encourage someone that you'll speak it to them in humility saying you know I could be wrong here but I feel like the Lord just wants to speak this over you encourage you build you up but if maybe you feel like the Lord has given you a word for the whole body 
And I want to provide an opportunity for you to share that right now. And then the rest of us, listen. We judge that according to the scripture and the voice of God. And then we hold on to what's good and let go of what wasn't for us. So if, if anybody here, two or three, feel like you have a word of encouragement for the whole body or comfort, exhortation, do you raise your hand and I'll bring you the microphone right now? This morning in my Bible study, I asked the Lord where he wanted me to go. And he said, 2 Samuel. I said, we've been there before. But I'm going to ask you to read 2 Samuel chapter 5. It's when David is becoming king. That chapter parallels what's happening in our world today. And both times that David went out and massively was successful, he stopped, sought the Lord's direction. And the Lord told him, first time, do it this way. Second time, do it that way. We need to stop at this time in our life when everything is so chaotic and seek the Lord. We're at that crossroad. Seek the Lord and listen and do as you're told. Amen. Thank you. Marilyn? Yes, uh, this fits with what Carol just said, but I was getting... The word says, when I am weak, then I am strong. Is there one more? to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Amen. Would you guys take some um, quiet time right now just to respond to that? Um, what Carol said... David thinking about the Philistines, how to attack them, and not just jumping in and assuming he knew what to do, but listening to the Lord's specific direction. Come from the front, come from behind, wait for the marching. Because when we stop and we listen to the Lord, that's when we're strong. In our own flesh and strength, we do it our own way, we're weak, we fail, but when we listen to the Lord's guidance, we're strong. And as you're praying and asking for the Lord's direction, why don't you pray and ask for more of the Holy Spirit in your life? Ask for that baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's that picture of the Holy Spirit, just um, you being so surrounded in the presence of God. It's like being dunked underwater. God's presence dripping off of you. Um, so would you take that time and just ask for a, a fresh uh, awareness and, the, and power and wisdom and guidance of the Holy Spirit that he would fill you anew today, or maybe for the first time. Go ahead and, and take that quiet time, start praying.
Thanks for taking that time to seek the Lord and his presence. Um, before we move on with what next, uh, Ramona has a scripture she wants to read over us. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, were peace, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So just like honey abounded in her works in the pain of Jason, and there's others here that uh, are in pain, but we have to keep our our focus on the Lord because he will abound with grace for us and all work. Amen. Thank you. That, that was good. good thank you everybody thank you for sharing thank you for that uh, time together for the presence of the Lord I just want to challenge you right now if you um, felt like the Lord gave you a word for a specific person instead of for the whole church don't forget about it right? share that maybe you need to write it down make a little note to yourself but uh, in just a little bit we're gonna have a greeting time and it might be a good opportunity to get up and go over to that person or shoot a quick text all right that being said, uh, was it, did I remember Ruth? Ruth Ann? Ruth Ann, would you come on up? And um, Aaron would, and Liz, would you, your whole family, come on up? We're going to do a baby dedication. Yeah, sure. You tell me when you're through. You go for it. This morning, my husband Tom and myself are extremely excited about the fact that this baby Liam, who is our great grandson, is being dedicated to the Lord. And we are thankful that he has a godly mom and dad and totally thankful that it's another family that will be lived for God's purpose. That's good, that's good. And right now that family's coming on up here. Uh, Pastor Julie, Pastor Frank, would you guys join me up here as we pray over them? So what we're doing right now is a baby dedication. Uh, Aaron and Liz have this baby, Liam. How old is he? Two years old. And they want to give Liam to the Lord. Um, it's kind of like in the uh, book of Samuel. There you are. <laughs> it's kind of like in the book of Samuel. Um, when Hannah comes and she says, I want this baby to belong to God. I prayed for the Lord. The Lord gave me this baby. And now this baby's going to belong to the Lord the rest of his life. Uh, that's kind of what we're doing here. Aaron and Liz bring in Liam. And it's sort of like when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple to dedicate their firstborn to the Lord. And, and then along came Simeon, and along came Anna, and they prayed and they prophesied over that baby. Um, that's what we're doing today. We are praying over this child and giving them to the Lord. Uh, in our denomination, we don't baptize babies because we feel that baptism is a decision to follow. It's an expression of your decision to follow Jesus. And that's something that only you can only make when you're older. Babies can't make that decision. But we do give them to Jesus as children, as parents. And uh, I was asking Aaron for uh, any, if there was anything that his uh, name, I don't know, Brian, if you can uh, maybe pull down that a little better. Uh, if there was anything that his name specifically meant or anything that they wanted uh, specifically prayed over him. And he said, no, as I was looking at it, and as I was researching and reading the Bible, what I really felt is like it's almost more about the parents. And, uh, and Aaron is spot on in that. What we're doing right now is not just dedicating Liam, but it's Aaron and Liz and their whole family dedicating themselves to raise this boy in a godly way. They're dedicating themselves and saying, Lord, we're standing before you right now and we're committing to you that we're going to raise this child the best of our ability 
to know you, to love you, to serve you. Amen? Amen. So I love that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, why don't you go ahead and share that, and then um, I'll pray, and you can pray, and I'll have maybe Pastor Frank put some oil on there. Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, first, I want to say thanks to um, the congregation for having us up here, and for everyone that came. I tell you that. Yep. Yep. And James and Julie for thinking about us, as always. And so to that, James did ask about Liam's name. So we did some research. And I'd done some research before. I just kind of forgot. So we're, you know, I'm Irish. My family's Irish. So it, Liam is an Irish name. Um, and so Liam does have a strong will warrior protector. Shortened version of the name Yuliam, which is helmet of will. Now, I don't know if that means the helmet of a person named Will or uh, will like our will, but yeah. Um, and so I'm glad we're all up here. Um, Pastor also asked if there was anything, you know, that was on our minds throughout this week. And yeah, one of the things we mentioned was that we, you know, I, I feel like it's a big responsibility, you know, raising children, leading them the right way. And so in the morning, you know, I, I wake up pretty early and sitting with, you know, my thoughts and God. Um, I've gotten better at trying to listen, decipher between my thoughts and God's thoughts. And it's kind of nice that everybody showed up, my family, because one of the things that kept coming back to me was that, you know, you're not in this alone. You know, I've got, God gave me a wife who is strong, um, has given me children who are strong that help, um, who's given me family who's strong and help. And it's not all on me. You know, we're all here. We're all in this together. Um, so that kept coming to mind. The other thing that came to mind, I, I was researching, like, scripture for stuff like this, um, was Jeremiah 1.5. Uh, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Um, and that, what that brought to mind is, just like I said, um, God knows exactly what, what I needed. What I need is, you know, other people to help me um, and knows what my son needs, which is all of us you know, to raise him in the right way. That's all I had to say. Good. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Aaron. All right. Well, that being said, let's get Liam. All right there, strong-willed warrior. And we're going to pray over you. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this young warrior, and we pray right now that you would fill him with your presence, fill him, Lord, with your spirit from a young age. May he know you and love you and serve you with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. We pray, Father, that you would give him a love for the scriptures, for the word of God, that he would love to read them and know them and remember them and live them. We pray that he would be bold to be an example with his life, that the way that he lives and the decisions that he makes would show others the truth of the gospel, the love of God, the power of God. We pray that his will would be surrendered to you all his days. In Jesus' name, and Lord, we do pray over Liz and Aaron and the whole family. We pray, Lord, your blessing on them, that as parents, Lord, they would have wisdom to know how to raise each of their children. Lord, that you would give them grace. Lord, that you would renew their energy. Even young men grow weary, youths faint. Lord, but that they would hope in you, that they would run and not grow weary, walk and not be faint, that they would rise up on wings like eagles. And Father, we pray for discernment and peace, that they wouldn't be anxious, there would be no spirit of condemnation, Lord, beating themselves up, asking if they're doing the right thing, but instead they would do just what we heard your spirit say this morning. They would wait on you, listen to you, obey you, and have peace. And know that they're doing what you're calling them to do. Bless Aaron to be the leader of his home, Lord. To uh, be that priest, Father, who takes the time to read his word, listen to you, and pray over his family, Lord, and lead them well. Bless Liz, Lord. She works so hard, Lord, tirelessly. I pray that you would bless her as she works and provides, Lord, with her, uh, uh, her side businesses, Jesus, as she works on the home, as she loves on the children. Give her energy, Lord, and bless her. I pray for health 
yourself over the children, over the parents, Lord. I pray that your protection would be over them, that no disease would touch them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Oh, here, and we've got, I got a little something for you. This is uh, bedtime prayers for Liam, and here's a three-minute devotional for Liz. So I'm going to give that to you, Aaron. That's, yeah, you betcha. We appreciate you guys. We appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Thank you for coming out. That was so good. That was so good. Well, and then there's one more baby we want to dedicate today. Um, and we asked Pastor Frank's help for this, because when a pastor needs his baby dedicated, what does he do? And so um, Pastor Frank is somebody that we love and admire and look up to and really respect in the Lord. And so we asked him if he would pray over and dedicate Judah for us. And I like to ask all the family. We've got our parents and our grandma and aunt and uncle. If you'd come on up, we'd love to have you guys up here with us. Yes. Are you sure? <laughs> okay. If you read in Genesis chapter 29, you'll see where Leah gave birth to Judah. And when she did, she said, now we can praise the Lord. And last Sunday morning, I was just stricken with the sight of Pastor James standing here during praise and worship service. And Judah was on his shoulders, and Judah was bouncing up and down, and actually, if you saw him, putting his hands together. And I thought of that scripture, Judah means praise, and that little guy during the whole worship service almost was on his dad's shoulder, putting his hands together and praising the Lord. So this morning, we can thank the Lord that he has given us little Judah to praise among us. And Lord, we thank you for Pastor James and Julie, and for giving them to us as our pastors. And now we thank you for giving us Judah to worship with us even at his little young age. Father, we pray that you will grow him up to be a strong leader, a strong worshiper, a strong praiser, and set the example among his peers that they will follow his example, Lord. We pray that we as his church congregation will never fail him. We pray that his parents, Pastor James and Julie, will never fail him. But the examples that we set before him as he's growing up will be, will be the kind of example that you will be proud of. Minister to him through them and through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor James is going to pray also. All right. Lord, we pray for Judah, Jack Dean Sanford. We praise God who is gracious in the valleys. Lord, we thank you that you have given him a spirit of praise. Lord, we ask that you would use that strong voice inside of him to praise you all his days, to lead people in the praise of God. We, Lord, Lord we pray for wisdom as his parents and his grandparents and his great-grandmas, Lord, and his siblings, aunts and uncles, that you would give us wisdom to know how to raise him, how to love him, how to train him, Lord, and how to help guide his will towards you, guide his heart towards you, his mind towards you. We pray your blessing over this baby. In Jesus' name, we give him to you for all his life, Lord. We lay him down before you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You too. Thank you, Pastor Frank. That meant a lot. Be blessed. That's right, you. Come here, you little bugger. You. You. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was good. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody, for being a part of that, for the Faherty family and for, what's that? And for, for the Sanford, Lapman, Eubank family. We, um, we really appreciate that. You guys, they say it takes a village to raise a child, but that's not true. It takes a church to raise a child is what it takes. So uh, we gather together to support each other, and, uh, and that's what Sunday's morning's about, and that's what all week long is all about, gathering together, encouraging each other, and speaking life over each other. And for being a part of those baby dedications. Right now, the kids are back in kids' service, and, uh, and you know, it's important that we all realize that the, the primary responsibility for discipling our kids falls 
on the parents, right? It's, it's the parents' job to teach the kids about Jesus, to teach them to love the Lord. It's not the church's primary responsibility. It's the parents' primary responsibility, right? So uh, parents, I just want you to hear that and own that. That's what Liz and Aaron were up here declaring. That's what Julie and I were declaring. But that being said, we all work together in that. We all play a role in loving on the kids around us, speaking life on the youth and the children, the babies around us, encouraging the parents, the single moms, the single dads around us. That's important for all of us to be doing. Whether you have any kids or not, whether you've ever had kids or not, you are supposed to be loving and speaking life and raising those kids up, partnering with those parents and raising the kids in the Lord. And uh, I just want to give a shout out to those who are doing Sunday school right now, Kids Church right now. Um, they are awesome. They are heroes. And uh, we so appreciate them as well as Masumba Kent, who does the youth program, uh, and uh, everybody else who helps and volunteers. And I would encourage you guys to think about getting involved with youth or kids. That's so important. We had some of our prayer warriors wake up in the middle of the night um, just weeping for our children this week, Thursday, uh, Thursday morning. They just woke up weeping for the next generation. And what a powerful heart. And I, I would encourage you all, we know that the enemy has plans for the next generation, but so does our God. Our God has plans for the next generation. And our prayers are powerful and make a difference. And we need to be praying. And we need to put foot, feet to those prayers by getting involved. Amen? Amen. All right. And speaking of it, getting involved, just encourage you again about the calendar team. They've got a couple events already planned or in the works for Christmas season. So if you, uh, if you want to have a hand in what's going on around the church, parades and, uh, and events, movie nights, uh, I encourage you to make sure not to miss that. Whew. Well, that being said, we're going to jump right in because I got a lot to go through and we talked about a Q&A today. Uh, for the first seven chapters of Revelation, I don't know if that's going to happen, but we'll see what we can do, all right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your love. You are so, so incredibly good to us, Lord. But God demonstrates his mercy for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, Father, that we have been raised with Christ, seated with him in the heavenly realms, seated with you in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Lord, that you are going to take all eternity to demonstrate the kindness of God toward us, the riches of your grace. Thank you, Lord, that you are so good to us. We pray, Lord, as we look at your scripture, as we look at your word, give us encouragement, give us strength, give us boldness, Lord, not to be afraid of what's coming, but to embrace it as part of your plan and to look to see what our role in that plan is. And I pray, Lord, that as we read the scriptures, that you would give us wisdom, a spirit of wisdom and revelation, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And as we look at things that Honestly, there's a lot of opinions about. I pray also for grace for one another when we disagree over things that aren't essential. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, well, we are going through the book of Revelation, and there are a lot of opinions about Revelation. Um, we are currently uh, in chapter 7, wrapping up chapter 7. Last week, Honey Hansen shared... Uh, about what God did through her in the Philippines. And I just want to let you know, she emailed me, sent a couple pictures. She made it to Arkansas, to the YWAM base over there. Uh, the YWAM staff welcomed her, and they're getting rolling already. And also, oh, sunny day, they sent me some pictures last night um, for our 44th anniversary, uh, the church donated $4,400 uh, to Oh Sunny Day on behalf of Pastor Frank and Bonnie. And uh, that was designated to repair their fishing boat and to build a kitchen for their primary school. And they sent me pictures of the walls are already up. They haven't done the roof yet, but the walls are already up on the kitchen in the primary school. Things happen a lot faster. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Praise God. Um, things happen a lot faster in Uganda than here, where you have to get permits, and you have to wait to get the foundation checked out, and you have to do this, and you have to do that. Over there, they just build it. I love it. Okay, well, Revelation chapter 7. So last week was Honey Hansen, and the week before that was our family service. 
and we talked about the great multitude, and it was the second day of the Feast of Booths. Good. Feast of Booths, and we built booths here. The Jewish people call it Sukkot, um, and they, they build the booths, and they're supposed to live in them for seven days, and that ties into the book of Revelation, chapter 7, because you see uh, the great multitude coming and waving these palm branches, just like the Jewish people do in their synagogues. They wave these branches, and they praise God who rescued them through the wilderness. And here in Revelation chapter 7, there's a great multitude from every tribe, tongue, and nation, not just Jewish people, who come before the throne and wave branches and praise God who was a shelter for them and who will protect them from heat, uh, just like the cloud in the desert protected the Israelites um, all those 40 years. And so they're celebrating the Feast of Booths there in heaven, which is a pretty cool thing. So that was two weeks ago at our family service. Let's, uh, let's just recap where we're at. Um, so the seals, Lord help. So the, the uh, seals that are uh, in the book of Revelation kind of revolves around these seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. And each of those seals, trumpets, and bowls represents a different event happening um, tied to the end of time when Jesus comes back. Uh, we talked about how um, there are different views. Some people see that happening consecutively. Um, first, all of the seals, and then all of the bowls, and then all of the trumpets. Some people see it as they're just explaining the exact same thing seven ways, and so each bowl, seal, and trumpet is just explaining the same thing. And then here's the view that, that I personally espouse, um, which is that uh, it's this sort of, they're uh, happening at the same time, but it's like a telescope zooming in on the end as you go. So you've got the seven seals, uh, which spans the longest period of time, um, beginning with that first seal, the white horse and the, white, and the rider on it, all the way to this seventh seal, the time of silence, which comes after this huge earthquake when the stars fall out of the sky and the sky rolls up like a scroll and every mountain falls down. Sounds a lot like the end. And then after that, you've got this half hour of silence. And then you zoom in and you've got the seven trumpets. And I believe it goes back over and looks again over this seven-year period. But now it's zooming in towards the end. And these trumpets are worse in, in, in general than the seals. Because like in the seals, you see a quarter of the earth dying. In the trumpets, it's all about thirds. A third of the world gets burned up. Um, a third of the oceans turn to, to blood. A third of the waters become bitter. And then you go back and look at the end again, but this time from the picture of the bulls, and they're pouring out God's wrath, God's judgment on the world because of its, uh, the way that they treated, the way that the world has treated God's people. Did you know that that's actually what these judgments are about? In the end, God is judging the world not only because they have rejected him, that's primary, but he's also judging the world because they've rejected us. I don't know if you knew that or not, but in the world's act of uh, persecuting and killing believers, God remembers that. God sees that, and he will call that blood to account. Now, we don't have time to go back over and cover all this ground again. If you're interested, you can hear the uh, other sermons. They're all recorded. Um, but we're going to keep moving on. And, uh, and today, let's, let's look at this, these seals. We've got the first seal, uh, the white horse, and I talked about four different things that could be. The second seal, which is the red horse, which is war um, coming on the earth. The third seal, which is the black horse, which is famine. Um, and to such a degree that um, food, it would take an entire day's wage to buy enough wheat to feed one man or an entire day's wage to buy enough barley, cheaper and less expensive, to feed a family of three. That's how bad that famine is going to get. And then the fourth horse, which is the black horse, or the pale horse, which is death. And in that uh, seal, that judgment, a quarter of the world dies from war and from famine and from plague and from wild beasts. We talked about how that's 130 times worse than 2019. Looked at statistics about how many people died from those four things in 2019. And what this is describing is 130 times worse. It's actually about um, 10 times worse than World War II. A little less, about eight times worse than World War II. About three and a half percent of the world died from famine and from plague and from war during those five years. 
And we're talking 25% of the world. This is dark times. And when he opened the uh, fifth seal, it was the martyrs, those who had died for the cause of Jesus. And it, they're, they're pictured as being underneath the altar where the sacrifices are made because they have given their life as a sacrifice to God. They poured out their blood in worship to God. And they cry out to God, how long until you judge the world for slaying us, for pouring out our blood? And God's response is to wait a little bit longer because there are more of us who will be martyred. More of us who will be martyred. And they have to wait until that full number is completed. And then he opens the sixth seal. And let's look at this seal real quick. Verse 12, chapter 6, Revelation. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became as black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that's being rolled up, and every mountain and isle island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? That's the end of chapter 6. That's the end of the sixth seal. And then you have chapter 7, which doesn't talk about the seals at all. And then chapter 8, verse 1 is the seventh seal. And so you kind of ask, why is this chapter 7 thrown in here before the sixth and seventh seal? Why this pause? Why this break? And I believe it's answering that question. The great day of the Lord has come, and who can stand? Who can stand when a quarter of the world is dying from all these things? When, when, um, when earthquakes are bringing mountains down to the ground, when, skies are fall, when stars are falling out of the sky? Who can stand? And to answer that question, God flashes back for John and shows him four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding back the four winds of the earth that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So who can stand? Those who've been sealed by God. Revelation chapter 7 is divided into two parts. The first part is this 144,000 that we're going to look at today. The second part is the great multitude from every tribe, nation, language, and tongue who, um, who are coming out of the tribulation, who have washed their robes white. Um, it's interesting, this first part, it's 144,000, 12,000 from every tribe. It reads just like in the book of Numbers when it lists out how many people from each tribe of Israel are marching out to war. And this is like an army roster. Um, as a matter of fact, if you look a little bit later, it's a, well, no, we'll get to that. Uh, this is like an army roster. And then you look at the second part of chapter 7. It's like a party. It's people from every tribe, tongue, and nation that are before the throne. They're waving branches. They're singing. They're celebrating. They're saying, praise God, who will wipe away every tear from our eyes, who will shelter us from the heat, will never thirst again, never hunger again. The Lamb will be our shepherd, and he will watch over us. Hallelujah. Right? So you got the army in the first half and this party in the second half. I love it. And, and there's two different views on this. Some people see these as two different groups. And some people say they see these as two different times, two different groups or two different times. Um, so it could be that this 144,000 is uh, 12,000 from each tribe that he's saying specifically, literally, these are the people of Israel, 12,000 from each tribe, uh, the army of God who's going into this tribulation period. 
And that this great multitude is all the Gentile church, is how it's usually understood, the Gentile church um, that is being killed and coming up out of the tribulation and worshiping God before the throne. Or it could be that this is describing the same group, all of God's people, all of God's people, 12 times 12 times 1,000, who are living here as soldiers for the Lord. And later, describing all of God's people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, praising God as they lay their life down as a sacrifice. Two different ways to look at it, and we'll look at that a little bit more in depth here. But before we do, look at verse 1 of chapter 7 again. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. So obviously we know, because a couple verses later he says, don't harm. Uh, He says to the angels who are given power to harm earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or sea or trees until we have sealed the servants of our God. Well, we know there's just been a huge earthquake that leveled every island and the stars fell out of the sky. We know that there has been harm done. So this is obviously going back before all that and showing us that before God brings any judgment at all, he is sealing and protecting his people. Before one leaf falls to the ground, God has placed his seal on his people's forehead. This parallels with uh, the book of Zechariah chapter 6. Um, If you look there at verse 1, it says, uh, Zechariah gets this vision. He says, again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four chariots came. It's going to sound really familiar. The first chariot had red horses. The second chariot, black horses. The third, white horses. And the fourth chariot, dappled horses, all of them strong. Similar colors, different order. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said to me, these are going out to the four winds of heaven after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. So so you see here that these, these angels, these four angels, the four spirits, four winds, the word for wind and spirits, the same word, by the way. Um, it's talking about the seals, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Like, none of that's going to happen before God says, this is my child. These are my people. So we are not going in anywhere without the seal of God on our forehead first. So then you got to ask, what is that seal? And by the way, if you keep, like, look at that passage in Zechariah chapter 6, you can come up with all sorts of possibilities and curiosities and correlations, like maybe, you know, brass, where's the... But we're not going to go there, because it's, one, it's very conjecture, and two, we just don't have time. Um, So what is the seal of God that God has put on their forehead? Well, in the book of Ezekiel chapter 9, this is, again, like Revelation is just pulling on all these parts of the Bible. And to really understand Revelation, you got to read the whole Bible, or you're never going to understand this last book. Um, it, remember, when we read Scripture, we have to use the Bible to understand the Bible, right? you got to use Scripture to interpret Scripture. So anyways, back in Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4, God, uh, it's interesting, Ezekiel gets this vision of God on his throne, kind of like John gets a vision of God on the throne, and he sees four beasts, kind of like John sees these four beasts before God on the throne. There's a lot of parallels here. And then, um, so he sees a vision just like he saw in chapter 1, and then God is saying, I'm going to judge Jerusalem for its sin. And uh, he, he actually, if you read it, it says there's a loud voice that says, bring near those who are supposed to bring judgment. Kind of like this loud voice that says, come, and the horsemen of the apocalypse come. Well, in Ezekiel 9, there's a loud voice that says, bring near, or some translations say, come near, come. And these six men and a seventh who's dressed in linen come. So in Revelation, someone shouts, come, and seven seals are broken. In Ezekiel, someone shouts, come, and these seven people come forward representing judgment and deliverance. And before the, uh, the judgment of God begins, God says to the six angels who are going to bring judgment on his people, he says, don't harm anybody until this other guy who has a, a writing kit at his side goes through and, and marks out all the people who, who repent and tremble at, at my word and puts a little mark on their forehead. And then you other six 
you go back behind this guy who's putting a mark on the forehead of everybody who mourns and is repentant and who feels so frustrated about the sin and the wickedness of Jerusalem. Go behind, and anyone who doesn't have that mark on their head, kill them. Right? Judgment. But anybody who does have that mark, don't lay a finger on them. So in Ezekiel chapter 9, that John here, that like, this vision is referencing back to, that seal, that sign is showing God's protection from his judgment on his people. Um, you see the same thing, uh, ironically enough, Revelation chapter 9, verse 4. Um, it's the uh, plague of the demon locusts, you could call them, these crazy grasshoppers that, that have tails like scorpions, and they sting people, and they writhe in pain for five months. They are told specifically not to sting anybody who has the seal of God on their forehead. So this seal that the 144,000 are given is protecting them from the wrath of God. And it's protecting them to some degree. He says, don't harm the trees, the grass, any of these other plagues on the earth until I've sealed them. Why? Because that seal is going to offer some level of protection. Um, so look, what is that seal? Well, 2 Corinthians 1.22, Ephesians 1.13, actually, yeah, and Ephesians 4.30 all talk about us being sealed or the Holy Spirit coming inside of us, sealing us, stamping us for the day of salvation. So the seal could reference the Holy Spirit of God that has sealed us. It's like the signet ring in the, in the wet wax. I'd press that ring in, and it would be a picture, you know, the name or a picture that would be in that wet wax, and that stamp, now you know, that belongs to that person. Well, God's putting his seal on our foreheads. It's his spirit inside of us. We begin to look like God. People know that we belong to God because his spirit is in us. We look like God. His image is stamped on us. Um, if you go on to that next slide now, in chapter 14, verse 1, it actually specifically says the 144,000 have God's name written on their foreheads. So what is that seal? It's God's name written across their heads. Um, that makes sense because the name of a person is supposed to, in, in ancient culture, capture, encapsulate the character of the person right? Who that person is. So God's spirit on us, his name written on us, his character in us, his presence in our life. It's interesting. Ephesians 3, 12 says that everybody who overcomes will have God's name written on them. In Revelation 22, 4, it's a picture of the new earth, the heaven, new heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem. After all this craziness is said and done and God starts things over again. And what do you know? Every believer has God's name written on their heads. And this is in direct contrast to the mark of the beast, the Antichrist, the number of his name written on people's foreheads or hands. So at the end of the day, everybody will have a name written on them, either the name of the beast or the name of God. We will all be stamped. We will all have a name. Woo. All right. Okay. Okay. So let's, let's go back. Who are these 144,000? Two different interpretations. It could be Israelites, 12,000 from every tribe, just like it says. And there's a lot of good reason to think that. Um, for one, it's always best to take the Bible literal when you can, right? It's good to just read it like it says. Um, so reading it, it says, and I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben. 12,000 from the tribe of Gad. 12,000 from the tribe of Asher. 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali. 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh. 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon. 12,000 from the tribe of Levi. 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar. 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun. 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph. 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. So you might read that and say, well, how is there any question? It spells it out. It even lists the tribes so that you know this is literal. It's just 12,000 uh, from each of these 12 tribes. Another good reason to take it literal is that we know from prophecies like Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14 and following, um, and like uh, Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, there will be a revival among the literal, physical Jewish people, the nation of Israel. There will be a revival among the Jewish people in the last days. 
A matter of fact, Paul says in Romans 11 that the Jewish people getting saved is actually going to be like a big flashing sign saying, hey, the end is here. Right? That their they're being saved is a sign that, that Jesus is coming back. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so it would make sense then to see, well, here, here the people of God are getting saved. Uh, the, the Israelites are getting saved. Um, some people balk at the fact that this lists the northern tribes that seem to have disappeared. We know at the time of Jesus that tribes like the tribe of Asher were still in existence because, remember, Anna, who was there at the dedication of Jesus, was from the tribe of Asher. So some of those northern tribes still existed and knew who they were at Jesus' time, um, which was 800 years after their nation, 722 years after their nation fell. Um, and like I said, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14, specifically, that chapter is talking about the northern kingdom, if I remember right. But there are other prophecies that talk specifically about the northern kingdom getting saved as well. So that's no problem at all. God promised that elsewhere. That's going to happen. So a lot of good reason to take this literal. But there's also a lot of good reason to take it figurative. Right? Of course. Of course. Uh, one reason is that the Jewish people, when you look and read the Old Testament carefully, it looks like they actually get saved after Jerusalem is destroyed and then when Jesus is coming back to rescue Israel. That that's, that it's actually not till the very, very end that they really come back to the Lord. And, and we'll look at this more when we get to the end of Revelation, um, but just one passage to kind of point that out, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 8. It says, on that day, the Yahweh will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them on that day shall be like David. If you go back before verse 8, it talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, so that the feeblest among them in that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of Yahweh going before them. And on that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Kind of sounds like Armageddon. And after Armageddon, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. So it's Jesus comes and rescues Jerusalem and then they look on him whom they've pierced and they mourn and they weep because they realize they've rejected their Messiah all these years. And you look at the first verse of the next chapter, it says, on that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. What is that but their salvation? Them coming to the Lord. So it doesn't actually picture the Jewish revival as happening at the beginning of the seven years, but at the end. It's kind of interesting. Um, and there's a lot of other passages that we won't get into today. Um, also, um, there's the fact that uh, who has the seal of God on their forehead? We all do. We all do. We're all, all of us have God's name written on us. All of us have God's spirit in us. It's not just 144,000 specific Jewish people who have God's name written on them and have God's spirit in them. It's all of us. Who do you think God will protect during this season of tribulation? Do you think God only cares about them or is only going to protect them and not his, the rest of his people? I don't think so. So then why would it list them out specifically as being sealed? And then there's the fact that, well, 12, 12 is a very important number. 12 does symbolize the people of God. And, and who is this? But it's 12 at, times 12 again. 144, it's like, hey, it's like the new Jerusalem. It's laid out 12 by 12. You know, it's 144. It's all of us times a thousand, all of us to the full, every person could be. Um, you also have uh, the question then, well, well, why then list it out tribe by tribe by tribe? Well, there's a difficulty there. Tribe by tribe by tribe. Did you know that in that list, the tribe of Dan is missing? And that it lists Manasseh, who's Joseph's son, not a son of Jacob. But it doesn't list Ephraim, who's Joseph's other son, Manasseh's brother. Uh, if you put up the, the list of kids there, yeah. So it starts off with Judah, who's not the oldest, and then goes to Reuben, who is the oldest, which 
Reuben lost his right of firstborn. But then it goes to Gad, who's like uh, 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 Gad and Asher, who are younger than Naphtali, who should be older, and it leaves out Dan. And then you've got Manasseh, who's um, the grandson from Rachel's side. And then it jumps over to Leah's side, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun. And then it comes back over to Rachel's side again, Joseph and Benjamin. In fact, you never see this list anywhere else. You never see a list even close to this, the order here, anywhere else. It's not talking about the, the, the land-granted tribes because Levi's included and he didn't get any land. It's not talking about the sons of Jacob because Manasseh's included and he's not one of Jacob's son. Like, what's going on with this list? It's pretty weird. I've wrestled with that for a long time. And I have an idea what I think it means. And this isn't something I pulled from a commentary. This is just something... That came from me, so take it for, with a grain of salt, because it's always better when other people, you know, if it's more than just one voice. If it's just one voice, hey, I mean, he, he could be drinking some weird Kool-Aid. So take that, take that into consideration. But if you look at the names of these kids, Dan is not mentioned. His tribe means judgment. Dan means judgment. So judgment's out of the picture here. If you go to that next slide, praise. By the way, the names are in bold. The words I added are not bolded. Praise. See? A son. Good fortune and happiness. Struggle we're made to forget. He has heard and joined a reward. Honor may he add to the son of the right hand. Could be because you never see this list anywhere else and judgment's not included for the people of God. Hallelujah. Um... So that could be what's going on here, that he's saying, hey, when we're here on earth, we're like an army telling people the good news of God. We were God's people 12 times, 12 times a thousand, right? We're all of us. And then when we get to heaven, it's going to be a party. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's celebrate. So don't be afraid of all these six seals that we just read about because you are sealed yourself for God. You're a soldier here, and you're going to party with him later. Amen? Amen. Um, I just want to flip real quick and look at Psalm 97. This is such an interesting 97, 98, and, and even 45. I don't know if we'll read them all, but they're just so interesting because it's different than the way that we typically think about things. Psalm 97 in the ESV says, Yahweh reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before Yahweh, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all the people see his glory. All worshipers of images, idols, are put to shame who make their boast in worthless idols. Worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and is glad. The daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. The people of God rejoice because of your judgments. O Yahweh, for you, O Yahweh, are most high over all the earth. Thou, O Lord, are exalted far above all gods. And you look at Psalm 98. Sing to Yahweh a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand, his holy arm have worked salvation for him. Yahweh has made known his salvation. By the way, when I say Yahweh, that's just the... That's the name that God revealed himself as at the, at the burning bush. I am who I am. And when you see the Lord, all caps in your translation, that's, that's just what it's saying. It's saying Yahweh. It's letting you know that's what the word is there. Yahweh has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He's remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to Yahweh, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to Yahweh with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the king, Yahweh. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before Yahweh, 
before he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. I mean, how often do you think of God's judgment and break out into a new song and start leaping for joy? How often do you think of God coming like it describes in the book of Revelation and you think, man, give me the piano. I just need to write a new worship song. That's just wonderful. Demon locusts, crazy earthquakes. Get the guitar out. Let's praise God. But when you look at like these Psalm 97, 98, Psalm 45, you look at Isaiah 25, this is, this is the way the people of God respond to God's judgment well, because his judgment is righteous. You can trust that the Lord knows what he's doing. You can trust that the Lord is doing the right thing, that he will give people every chance to repent, that he will watch over his children, that he's loving and kind and gracious, but also just and righteous, and he keeps his word. When we think of the end times, we shouldn't panic. We shouldn't be fearful. Instead, we should remember before any of it starts, we are sealed. We are sealed by God. His name is written on our heads. We belong to him. And he's not going to start. A single leaf isn't going to blow to the ground by the winds, north, south, east, or west, before he's taken care of you and watched over you. He knows the hairs on your head. And his judgments are just and righteous, And he's faithful. And there is a new heaven and a new earth that we all are looking forward to with joy and excitement and anticipation where righteousness and mercy will kiss. Lord, let it be. Lord, let it be. And then you got the seventh seal. Let's go ahead and look at it just so that we can close this chapter. Uh, Technically, it's chapter 8, verse 1. Um, it says that then he broke this, when the lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. We don't know why. Heaven's a loud place. Lots of singing, lots of rejoicing, lots of shouting. But all of a sudden, completely silent. For half an hour. For a short time. We'll throw out some ideas to you, and you can decide. Um, it could be that God's recreating everything brand new, and people are holding their breath watching. It, it could be, um, remember, this is a scroll that's being opened, and this is the seventh seal, so now the scroll is finally opened. It could be that everyone is silent and quiet as that scroll is being read. It could be, let me flip over to Revelation to actually give this context. Remember, right before that seventh seal, it describes the great multitude, the party in heaven. And who are these people? They're the ones coming out of the great tribulation who've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Remember, right at the very beginning of this book, John says, I'm your partner in the tribulation, the suffering, in the kingdom and glory that are ours in Christ Jesus. Here, these are the ones who are coming out of the tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And it says, Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will shelter them with His presence, with His cloud, fire. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb... In the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. These are people who suffered. God's going to protect us. He's righteous. He's just. We can rejoice, but they have suffered, and now their suffering is over. Now it's the time for their comfort. And what if this half hour of silence is almost like the lamb walking through that crowd, wiping away tears, loving on these people who've just overcome while heaven holds its breath and watches. How wonderful it will be to have that special time with the Lord someday.
personally, one-on-one, because God's able to do that for each one of us. And to know in that moment that it was all worth it. And our only desire will be to have when we see the reward and the disproportionate goodness of God to the little effort and the little suffering we put in in this life, if we really knew, how much more would we want to be doing? For the glory that waits us far outweighs this momentary suffering. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much. Um, that you love us, that you care for us, Uh, that you're the lamb that was slain for our sins and you're the shepherd who watches over our souls. You're our friend and our king. You are God and a man who knows our sorrows and knows how we suffer. You are amazing. You are beautiful. And we're humbled at your presence, and we ask that you would give us courage and joy and anticipation as we look towards the end. Fill us with hope, the hope of our salvation. That though we do not see you now, we believe in you. And even though we do not see you now, we would be filled with a glorious and inexpressible joy as we receive the end result of our faith, the salvation of our souls. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus as King, as Savior, as Shepherd, as Friend, as Lord, He wants to meet you. He wants to meet you right now. He wants to welcome you right now. He wants to wrap you in His arms spiritually right now, just like He will do physically someday. Sure beats the alternative because we all will have someone's name written on our heads and I want to have God's name written on mine. If you would like to know Jesus like I'm describing, would you raise your hand and I will just guide you in a simple prayer of introduction. And for anyone who might be watching online, would you all pray with me? I love you, Jesus. And I believe that you love me. I believe you died for me so that I could be forgiven. And I believe you came back to life so that I could live forever. I want to know you, to join you, in your suffering and in your life to become like you and to belong to you forever. Please forgive me for my sins. I give myself to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you guys for sharing that with me. like I said, I was hoping to have a Q&A today, and uh, we ran out of time. Um, but be thinking about your questions, and hey, if you want to email them in, you can do that. If you want to drop them in the offering box, you can do that, and, and we will find a time to, to go over them. And we're looking right now just to chapters 1 through 7. Next week, right now, the plan is to jump into the trumpets, so giddy up. Here we go. I love you guys. Have a wonderful week, and I look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Be blessed.